Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Uh, je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour une nouvelle conférence virtuelle du CDTS. I am delighted to welcome you today for a new CLTS virtual talk. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Florian Martin Barito. I am an associate professor of law and the director of the University of Ottawa Center for Law, Technology and Society. And I am also the scientific director of the AI and Society Initiative that is co-presenting uh, this event thanks to the support of the Scotiabank Fund for AI and Society. For today's virtual talk, I am extremely delighted, there is no uh, word strong enough to say so, to be joined by uh, one of our colleagues from the Network of Centers, uh, Nagla Risk. Uh, a professor of economics, uh, Professor Risk is the founding director of the Access to Knowledge for Development Center, also known as, uh, as A2K4D, at the American University in Cairo School of Business. Um, she's an associate member of CLTS, and Professor Risk is also one of the co-leads of Open Air, the Open American Innovation Research network that CLTS has the privilege to uh, be hosting one of the hub of that uh, network. Um, Professor Risk research uh, areas in the economics of knowledge, technology and development with focus on digital platform, innovation, knowledge governance, uh, business models and inclusive growth in the Middle East and Africa. And today she will share with us a recent work looking into the economics of data, AI and inclusion, notably with respect to gender uh, in Egypt and in the Middle East. Without further ado, I will um, give the virtual floor to uh, Professor Risk for uh, about 30 minutes of presentation. Um, and then I will uh, facilitate the, the conversation uh with the the audience again please uh, feel free to ask your question in the conversation uh bar. so professor professor risk dear nagla thank you very much thank you very much uh, florian and uh, thank you uh, uh, clts for hosting me i'm very proud to be speaking to you and everyone uh, today uh, as uh, florian has mentioned i am associate member of the center and uh, very proud a member of the steering committee and the group of the Open African Innovation Research Network. So uh, thanks again for hosting me. Uh, allow me then to, uh, to delve into the topic right away. And basically, as Florian mentioned, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about uh, the uh, AI, um, uh, artificial intelligence, data and inclusion in, in Egypt, uh, especially in light of the recent health crisis of COVID-19. So let me uh, immediately start and ask, why is this important? Why do we have to talk about this topic? Well, the discourse over AI and inclusion is an amplified version of earlier debates of digital technologies and inclusive development. On the one hand, technologies uh, can magnify in the existing inequalities, widen uh, prevailing gaps, and on the other hand, they can consciously uh, be consciously used towards mitigating inequalities and um, uh, promotion of inclusive development. Uh, talk about uh, ICT uh, for development previously, and now the, the, we usually speak of uh, data for good, AI for good, and uh, the hope of achieving the sustainable development goals. Now, uh, usually uh, the, the poor, the marginalized and informal communities, women, the disabled, fall at the heart of this paradox, as they typically stand to be disfavored by uh, biases in data and algorithms in AI that can amplify these inequalities. These same groups also stand to benefit from the conscious policies that can address anomalies and promote inclusion. So if we think of a chain, a link, you have the data is one link and then you have the algorithm is another. And within that, this leads to outputs that inform policy making problems, triggers of any inequality in, in any of those links in the data, in the algorithm, in the infrastructure, in the enabling environment, in the human element involved, any, each one of those has a trigger for potential inequality. And then the danger then is to achieve skewed policy making. 
uh, then at the end of the day, um, we as, as people, uh, not just the marginalized, are the subject of data and any deficiencies there, any absence of us as people in the data or in uh, the process of making of the algorithm will translate into skewed policy making. The threat becomes more challenging in contexts like Egypt, where inequality is multifaceted, uh, where it is layered, multidimensional, extending beyond income inequality to include discrepancies in education, employment, health, sanitation, housing, active citizenry. It exists along dimensions of gender, geography, ethnic and social background and others. So these analog inequalities coupled with digital divides together uh, intersect with uh, different uh, disparities and feed into intertwined developmental inequalities that painfully across, uh, cut across lives and eventually becomes inequality of opportunity that keeps feeding further into uh, further uh, uh, lack of, of access and lack of opportunities for uh, the marginalized. So why is this important and why now? Why is it important now with the imminent, uh, with what's happening with COVID-19? Threats service, uh, surface in times of crisis. Vulnerabilities are exposed. So as COVID-19 hits, the marginalized are the ones who bear the brunt and the threat rather than the promise of AI uh, and technologies may be more likely to prevail. So today, uh, COVID-19 hits Egypt where the poverty rate is twice what it was in 2000. One in three people lives on less than 1.45 US dollars a day. More than 6 million people live on less than a dollar a day. While the officially announced unemployment rate is only 9%, unemployment is significantly high for women, 22%, educated, 21%, with advanced degrees, and the youth, 31%, respectively of the relevant cohorts in the labor force. Youth unemployment is especially worrying, 60% of the population are under 30 years old. We have a youth bulge. The population pyramid is very strong at the base. So this is our future. Uh, with 20% of these, uh, those under 30 years of age are not in education, employment, or training. So such is the legacy uh, preceding uh, the Arab Spring of the decades, the neoliberal policies of the economic reform and structure adjustment program led by the World Bank and the IMF and the uh, belief in trickle-down economics, which of course has failed miserably. So the objective was to draw foreign investment, achieve economic growth, so, which was actually achieved 7% uh, in the 90s, 5.1% on the eve of the Arab Spring. But surprise, surprise, we have dismal conditions of development, swelling pockets of poverty, unemployment, informal work, health conditions are dismal, and education as well. So one byproduct of this is Egypt's significant informal economy, it's classified as those who work with no contract and no security. Informal workers constitute more than 60% of Egypt's labor force. So that's about 20 million people. And I want you to remember that figure. I will come back to it. And it contributes to 40% of, of Egypt's GDP. So two thirds of the worker are living on precarious basis. The share of informal worker in, workers in labor force, if we exclude agriculture, is 53%. So 20 million people overall, if we exclude uh, informal workers in agriculture, 16 million people, urban informal workers. This is important. And in parallel, informal dwellings have mushroomed over the last decades. More than half of Cairo's residents and 40% of Alexandria's residents live in uh, informal dwellings. And it becomes worse in, in uh, remote parts of the city. And 60% of Egypt's urban areas are classified as unplanned and do not follow building regulations. Again, why is this important? Because there are there is marginalization, there is inequality that is hit by COVID-19, and we cannot afford to wait. We cannot afford to let any possibility of data and technology um, exacerbate these inequalities. Health and sanitary conditions in informal dwellings are dismal. Um, you know, uh, they lack uh, running water, electricity, sewage, and sanitation. Official statistics, 8.3 million people do not live in an apartment. 6.2 million do not have a tap inside their dwelling. And 8.4 persons do not own a private bathroom or kitchen. This incidence of disease, uh, health services, inequality in health services between uh, rural and urban and urban areas. And usually uh, the urban areas and affluent neighborhoods are relatively have better hospitals, better quality of health care. In addition, inequality in education. Uh, if you, we have 26 percent of Egyptian women are illiterate, 14 percent of men are illiterate, illiteracy rate. So talk about COVID-19. What does education online mean? 
when people do not have access to internet, they live in a poor dwelling and they have illiterate parents. So we cannot afford, this is why it is important. Why now? Because of the crisis and we have to act immediately towards not only safety nets and social protection, but for a medium and longer term, a develop, inclusive development policies. This is why it is urgent. There is an urgent need for immediate action for sustainable livelihood, not just hand-to-mouth relief for hand-to-mouth living. So just given that uh, background, let's talk a little bit about challenges to data and AI in Egypt. This is based on work that I did for um, um, uh, the handbook on AI, uh, Oxford handbook on AI ethics that's coming actually uh, later this month on um, uh, AI and inequality in the MENA region. I will focus my uh, thoughts here on Egypt, but some of that is also relevant to other parts of the region. So I will talk about data, I will talk about uh, the algorithm, challenges, I will focus on challenges of data. There are also aspects of people, I call it data, uh, the technology and people. Uh, there are issues related to human resources, to the uh, also enabling environment. So let me uh, start by data and I will talk a bit about that because that's also pertinent to the current situation. Uh, better data clearly enables, better data sets enable uh, uh, tuning algorithms to give better results. Biased data can cause or amplify inequalities, clear. So the sad uh, reality is that quality data is lacking in Egypt and the data that is available is subject to challenges. These can themselves create or amplify biases. So the first is data asymmetry. Asymmetry, there is an inequality in data. And usually um, data asymmetry is innate in power dynamics. Usually the owner of the data will be either the large businesses or the state. So when it's the large business, as opposed to uh, smaller um, initiatives and smaller enterprises, you're looking at uh, conditions of market concentration, you're looking at competition issues, you're looking at uh, market barriers, and feeding into market concentration and inequality within the market. For example, uh, health data, I'll give you an example, a few large labs uh, control the market own 70% of the country's health data sets. This is based on an interview with uh, one of the entrepreneurs in data analytics in Egypt. And listen to this quote, it was actually uh, taken last year, before COVID-19. This data, I quote, this data mine offers a huge potential for small agile companies to deploy AI for health services like predicting epidemics and future responses to particular medications. The concentration of these data sets in the market can be a barrier to innovation, specifically the inclusion of small companies in the market for development-related objectives like health. It is not clear whether and how these labs are making use of this data. The state owns uh, health data. There is the 100 million, uh, it's called Meet Million Seha, the 100 million health data that was collected over a campaign of last year, and it's not clear right now what it is being used for. So the first is data asymmetry, is a challenge. Data lock by the state, that's even more serious because this amplifies the power asymmetry in the data. Now, usually data is held by the statistical offices, and it's not, a data lock comes when it's not accessed by, data is not accessed by citizens, released in a timely manner, uh, politicized, filtered, incomplete, or censored. In a study of the Open Data Barometer uh, Global Study, the data, the statistics for Egypt are very interesting, actually, or the findings for Egypt, because along a set of questions, does the data exist in all the different sectors? Egypt has green, like it, yes, it does exist in all sectors, you name it, health, uh, education, um, environment, land ownership, you name it, it exists in all of them. Is, is, the, data, uh, is the data set up to date? Yellow, you know, like yellow or green, which is acceptable. But then when it's the questions start asking, is it available online from government in any form? Is the data set provided in machine readable and reusable formats? Is it reusable? Uh, is the data uh, reusable, available as a whole? Is it available free of charge? Once the questions start asking, then the red starts showing up, which clearly tells you that we do have an issue of the access to data for open data for use and usability by people, by citizens, by civil society, by entrepreneurs. The, the, for sure, the, the sectors that really show that data is not available at all is health data on health, crime, land registers, detailed government spending, and company registers. So this is, again, so the data asymmetry, the data locked by the states. Then we look at data inaccuracy, which uh, I, I believe is the most pertinent to what's happening with COVID-19. 
Now, data, I, I call it data, uh, you know, uh, blur, myopia and blindness. So myopia is nearsightedness. So data myopia comes from just seeing single dimensional lens that sees what's near, looks top down and doesn't really look at what is happening on the ground. Part of this is, uh, this leads to data blindness. Some people, some groups, some parts of the, the economies, individuals are completely absent from the radar of the national data statistics, completely absent. Data is blind to that. Or blur, the blur when you look at aggregates or averages that do not say much, they do not see any details, nuances, pixels, pixelated, you know, disaggregation, granulations. All of these are clouded by just opaque lens that looks at, um, you know, global averages or top down. An example is actually uh, data on, on um, inequality, but I'll get back to this uh, in a while. So I'll give you uh, specific examples from the COVID-19 situation. The government announced handouts uh, for uh, informal workers in Egypt in the amount of uh, 500 pounds over three months, Egyptian pounds, which uh, means 35 US dollars, about $100 over the three months to be excuse me, to be given to informal workers. Now, remember, this was this targets 2.5 million informal workers. Remember now the figure of 20 million. The figures, what is actually happening on the ground is the informal workers range from 16 to 20 million. And the target was for 2.5 million. Immediately, there is blindness to a whole group of workers out there that are not part of the policy. This is number one. Number two, the fourth, the application form for the handout was posted online. OK, this is a country where more than half the people do not have Internet access. Cyber cafes are expensive and Internet infrastructure is weak. OK, going back to illiteracy figures, we do have figures for illiteracy and people are asked to fill this uh, in writing. OK, so uh, clearly they sought the help of civil society, interviewed people who undertook this work, the help of civil society and others. Again, on the ID, if it says irregular work, you qualify. If it says you do not have work, you do not qualify. OK. Now, the types of work on the form was, listen to this, carpenter, welder, construction worker. These are all male-dominated uh, uh, jobs, work. So immediately, women who typically take, for in the informal sector, the, the, you know, the, the type of domestic helpers, caretakers, cleaners, uh, nursing, none of that is, is, is on the radar, on the map. None of that is on the form. You just have other. So immediately, there is a bias against women in that particular sector. So this is example number one. Second example, from the regular safety nets. Uh, papers usually are required to qualify. So people who live on borrowed electricity in slums will not have the utility bill required for safety net support. Divorced or separated women living in dwellings registered in the name of their absent ex-partners will not qualify. Even uh, traditional uh, uh, safety nets that uh, pay for women for households with children in school, a childless woman will not qualify. Again, uh, in the COVID relief services, uh, you know, um, information was people were encouraged to use smart cars and ATMs. This is a country, again, where 67% of the population rely on cash, 14 to 15% are banked, and 3.3% have credit cards, and a quarter of the population have debit cards. 9% of women are banked. So how can we, the lack of ownership of bank account can be traced to other invisibility. So how can we actually think of financial inclusion and have plans for women and have uh, algorithms for women if only 9% of them are banked? An example of an Egyptian startup launched a chatbot through Facebook named Sally, introduces people to credit card systems in Arabic. And while the chatbot is in bot is in Arabic and may seem more context specific, it is still exclusive as the percentage of Egyptians who have bank accounts is 14% and half of the population do not have access to internet or Facebook. So that sort of thing where just thinks of a narrow subset of people excludes people altogether. Education online again with uh, trying to find solutions with COVID-19 where a large percentage of the, of the children, they just do not have access to internet. I quote one testimonial from a woman. She says, when the school asked my little son to conduct the research instead of end of year exams because of the curfew and the corona thing, we cannot continue due to the lack of internet service as we cannot even pay a small amount to recharge the package of the internet. So all of these cause what are, what are called allocative harms. People are harmed if policies are designed based on data that only sees what it sees. This invisibility is very dangerous. Further, uh, more issues um, about the algorithm itself. 
and it also stands uh, the, the threat of decontextualization. They are typically developed in the global north, trained on data sets that are very different from the local context and may exclude certain communities, women included. This, this is very dangerous and again causes allocate, allocative harms. Algorithms, algorithms are also trained on data in specific times. And this, this came to my attention from one of my interviewees. He says they never uh, accounted for, for shocks like COVID-19. Algorithms that have to do with sales or preferences or even health are completely outdated now. This, the data and is just completely outdated and they're not accounting. They have to think again, given the new exogenous a variable that is taking place. And then, of course, there's the need for domain experts. So it is not just the marginalized that would be left out. It is also you and I, because if if these algorithms are designed by experts, technical exper experts, leaving behind people, for example, for health, doctors, for uh, education, educators, and even the, the, the beneficiaries, then at the end of the day, they are isolated uh, isolated uh, platforms that are detached from reality and decontextualized. Additional uh, challenges are the trade secrets of the algorithm, the IP, the intellectual property, another black box of intellectual content. The opaqueness uh, adds to the opaqueness of the, you know, of the process. So clearly data and algorithms are also part of a bigger political context and can be used as means for harmful and this is uh, very quickly touching on issues related to data and the algorithm. In addition, of course, there are issues related to people. A big challenge for the industry in Egypt is the brain drain. I, I mentioned youth unemployment and unemployment of the educated. So even among those who are employed, there is a challenge of retention uh, because companies usually uh, lose them to uh, either uh, abroad, uh, international companies or to uh, companies in the Gulf, the UAE in particular. Of course, there's a need for reskilling and cross-skilling, the loss of jobs in intermediate uh, skills, and clearly the, um, the first to go would be um, call centers, uh, outsourcing, because any job that can be done by a machine will uh, disappear, or can be replaced by uh, you know, a robot or a machine will uh, disappear. So what is being planned in a country that has a youth bulge, that has this you know, wealth, if I'd like to think of it as wealth of young people, how can we think of reskilling and cross-skilling and preparing for a different uh, future? With the enabling environment, of course, is necessary as part of the ecosystem. Egypt is not uh, typically high on uh, you know, freedom of information or access uh, to data. Uh, it does have uh, an, uh, you know, a, a data regulation, an open data portal. It does have the right to privacy. Um, does not have a Freedom of Information Act. There is a Telecom Regulation uh, Act. Uh, uh, it is uh, quite problematic because an example is also the issue that uh, surfaced in 2018 with Uber when uh, uh, the process of uh, passing the legislation uh, took some time in light of uh, issues related to privacy and consumer data. So within that, you know, uh, I, I want to, um, uh, ah, uh, Egypt does have an AI strategy in the, in the making, which is uh, something that is commendable. Uh, we hope that also it does include, uh, you know, awareness of the safety nets for those who are harmed. So there is a power of data and AI to marginalize potential, if you will. And um, uh, just so as not to leave with a negative note, let's look at rays of hope. There are rays of hope. First, Local homegrown uh, organic uh, grounds up initiatives, uh, small businesses, startups that pro carry the promise for human development. Uh, they, um, there are a number of uh, entrepreneurial initiatives quite successful uh, with innovative use of, of data for health and for uh, data analytics. Um, the uh, World Economic Forum last year had the 100 startups in the region and Egypt featured prominently there. Um, uh, there's also a women in, in coding. There is geekette, which is the plural, negative plural of geeks to sort of, uh, you know, the stereotype of a geek is usually a young male. But here there's geekette, a group of women who work on uh, developing uh, algorithms and technology. There are the women techies. There is Motun. Uh, so there are groups of women, uh, you know, working in code. Uh, as well, uh, there is an uh, interesting story of women in ride sharing, which we have uh, studied as part of our research, and how utilizing the data and the technology in, in simple, uh, you know, uh, such a simple thing as ride, ride sharing services uh, as Uber and Kareem, but it's no small thing in Egypt, breaking taboos of women drivers. Uh, so this, these are examples that are uh, successful. A second ray of hope is the novel data collection methodologies. 
and data-driven innovation and uh, working with rather than top-down methodologies, looking at uh, data crowdsourcing, mitigating the data asymmetry. There is an initiative like Biolek for traffic. There is Harass Map, uh, which also uh, which looks at uh, female harassment, uh, crowdsourcing data on female harassment. We have done uh, uh, several pieces of work uh, within the as the founding node of the Open. Uh, data for development in the MENA region, with also with our partners at uh, Open Air in Africa, we've done and with partners in the Arab, in different countries in the Arab world, on open source, crowdsourced uh, layering of the data layering of different data sets, in the area of transport and, the, uh, and uh, carbon uh, pol pollution in Cairo. Uh, a third ray of hope, so uh, uh, entrepreneurial initiatives, novel methodologies. A third ray of, ray of hope actually are a few rays coming from the government. We do have uh, the, the AI strategy has a fantastic advisor, which is uh, who is a wonderful friend of our center and is very progressive and thinking along the lines of the research and advocacy community. There is a ministry of planning have started new data platforms uh, that are quite hopeful and trying to uh, unify data and collect data in, in more accurate data and make it available. Uh, there is the data on health. We hope the one on 100 healthy lives that I mentioned earlier. I still stand to see what's going to happen, but we hope that the crisis will have reminded uh, people of the urgency, the government of the urgency of you know utilizing this data uh, for the good. In all of this, I think there is plenty of, of potential for uh, research. I mentioned work that we have done with our partners uh, in the area of uh, research and advocacy, open data, AI, and uh, inclusion. There is certainly a need for global partnerships, uh, like the one that we have with CLTS and other partners at Open Air. We're also very proud of our uh, other partners, uh, the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University, uh, with support of IDRC, Canada's International Deve Development Research Center, uh, SHIRC, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. We've worked with the Equals Research Group, with the Web Foundation, with the Network of Centers for Internet and Society, with the University of Toronto. So we have, a, 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 and, and, and with partners in different, in the Global South, Brazil, South Africa, Kenya, uh, India, because our, our, uh, there are a lot of commonalities in our issues. There are unique context specific in the different countries, but we have a lot of common issues and we need to speak one voice in trying to bring this together. Multidisciplinary uh, research, not only in academia, but also with partners in technology, with entrepreneurs, with innovators, civil society, community representatives, and the government, building on what exists, mappings that we have done and we and others have done of what is happening on the ground, identifying gaps, challenges, identifying the challenges and finding solutions uh, to, to uh, and, and novel methodologies and tools to uh, utilize uh, better data to improve health, education and skill development for sustainable livelihood beyond safety nets. So just a final word here that COVID-19 has really re reminds us of the danger of growth without development and with focusing on uh, numbers of uh, GDP growth and not looking at the components of that and what happens to health and what happens to education and income distribution. This is a painful lesson and we really, we hope, I hope that this uh, sort of is an alert to take matters further. It calls for immediate action, not just for healthcare and not just for safety nets, but for sustainable livelihood. In no other time has there been a need for evidence-based policy making, for inclusion, and that is why there is a need for a dire need actually for a sharp lens that finally captures all the data pixels to properly inform inclusive development policies and the, the search for um, proper technologies in order to inform policy making in the medium and the longer term. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much uh, Nagla for all those uh, information I was taking notes uh, and like I think you you draw quite a comprehensive uh, kind of like overview of what's happening, you know, like in Egypt right now and all the issues and and I think like still or like like in my well, you know my opinion because we discussed that before and that's why I'm very excited to be like more involved with the open network is that like even like you know in the north we often like kind of import the technology in the south and you mentioned that issue with the use of like AI and other algorithm train on like north specific data, then like just applied in a fully different uh, context to like uh, other kind of like societies. 
uh, and we have like also so much to learn, you know, because we were discussing about uh, how to maybe uh, rethink some policies because like just the way the city is or design varies. Like we build inequality by design even in the way we collect the data. And we have the same issues even in Canada, even like yeah. in the, such like the capital of, of the country. So, uh, so, so I see like some first uh, question in the chat. So again, I will remind uh, everybody, please ask your question uh, in the chat and I will facilitate the, the conversation. But um, I would myself have, uh, and I will use my, uh, my position as facilitator to, to be the, the first one to, to ask a question. Um, especially maybe uh, relying on one of the last uh, bits you said that we need, you know, evidence-based uh, policy making. Uh, and you mentioned also that there is, uh, we have a role as researchers that like advocate to, to like, you know, help public uh, uh, policy makers. What would you, what would be like you, maybe your key recommendation, you know, based on the, on your findings? uh like the kind of yeah what kind of like policy do we need and maybe uh even like in the Ed egyptian specific context because you mentioned that the country is currently developing the ai strategy so i'm guessing you, you may have been uh, invited to like advise the government on this so like based on your findings what are like the key um policy objective to make sure that we we build a more like inclusive uh society and we don't use and that basically we don't amplify uh, cur current injustices by technology. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, let me for the let me say a few words about the AI strategy. We uh, we worked as at the center uh, of actually towards uh, advice and helping. Uh, you know, not officially, but through our own independent work, we were already starting to to work towards an AI strategy. We were informed that something is happening with the ministry, so we we uh, sort of uh, had discussions. Uh, the, the, there is good news about the strategy and there is less good news about the strategy. Uh, the good news, uh, let's start with good news first, is that it does look at development uh, related areas. So there is talk about agriculture, there is look, there's looking at areas that are really necessary for uh, development. The, the not so good news is that uh, uh, to this day I have not been able to access um, the material easily uh, online we're told it's online but we have not been able to find the details of the strategy so i only uh, saw slides in conferences that were presented or where that i was asked to comment so this in and of itself is a bit um, worrying because you would want to have an ai strategy that's open for people to look and comment and and i'm in a fortunate position where we are as a, as a think tank if you will we act as a think tank informally and formally so that's uh, the thing now there are two uh, issues here. First, the, the closest to Egypt in looking at an AI strategy was India. We did a review of the AI strategies. India has a clear-cut AI for development, you know, agriculture, uh, health, education. So my hope is that this, these would be the priorities for Egypt, health and education in particular. For health, we do not even meet the minimum uh, requirement for expenditure on health that is uh, per se, as per our constitution. Our constitution says Egypt should be spending at 3% of GDP. We are we're hardly 1.5% 1. 1. of that. So if we are going to, to, the priority would be health. I would, my, my hope is that for the health data to be A, accurate, disaggregated also by, uh, by gender and to be at better data be available. But even whatever is there with labs, there, there are, is, is, are a lot of data available. So if that is made for sure, in, uh, ensuring the privacy, anonymity and all of this, but if this could be used for services and could be made for entrepreneurs, for young innovators who actually can work with the government and with civil society to try and have better health, this would be a priority for sure. And I would, as I mentioned, suspect that the data exists. This is one thing where the data exists. Education as well, for sure. I mean, in parallel with making, expanding the, the backbone of the internet, because if we're going to help people, and COVID-19 is staying for some time. I mean, the, the life around COVID-19, I hope COVID-19 goes away, but our life will not go to, to normal uh, in the very near future, I think. So how can we be prepared? And let's say COVID-19 passes, and you know we don't want to wait for another pandemic. And if we only uh, plan for... COVID-19, then we're very short-sighted, uh, actually, uh, in reality. So in order to prepare for better preparedness for as, an, as a society, as 
a society as people's dignity rather than just go living, you know, giving hand to mouth around the margins. I would look for policies that help inclusion for sure in our area. And you mentioned gender, women, inclusion of women in, in the data sphere is very, very important. And this is a priority for us. This is definitely research that we are starting and looking at how can we better uh, see visible women can be visible, not only in the data, but also in the making of algorithms and working with women entrepreneurs on how an algorithms, a pilot uh, algorithms that are of use and help to women in the area of health and child care. Uh, you know, these would be the immediate, immediate needs. And I hope that as researchers, we are able to do that and having the, the you know, the good rapport with uh, the ministry and with the AI strategy, I hope that this can be a process. Uh, again, I mentioned one of the excellent things that are happening is the advisor is excellent and is very much in touch with the intellectual community and with the practitioners. So this is very promising. I don't know if that answers your question, but th these are my thoughts in that direction. Mm -hmm. Now, and it's linked to uh, one of the questions that was asked in the, the chat by a graduate uh, researcher, like, uh, what was wondering, like, in your opinion, what would be the maybe key topic, you know, like a graduate student that is interested by all those questions right now, like, they want to start their, um, their like, master or PhD thesis, what would be, like, some of the key, you know, uh, issues that would be great to, to mm -hmm. tackle? Um, so on, on AI. Do we know the area? Is it a student in technology or in... Uh, I don't know the, okay. the area, but yeah, but for, for let's the, assume. I will answer your question, but like we should all work together and exactly. so should exactly. your work exactly. anyway. <laughs> so let's take the objective of the research, the objective research area and then go back to see who can do what, you know, like we do in our research projects. So a graduate student, I think, would look at new applications for better health uh, services, better health delivery, and better, uh, you know, especially for the poor and the marginalized. So this would be an area that is of utmost importance. Uh, again, new models of education uh, for children and for adults. Definitely uh, new, uh, new ways of delivering and for, of content also of education. I would also think um, the new skills, so not necessarily formal education, but continuing education. What are the areas of continuing education, of reskilling, and also cross-skilling? So uh, given what we're talking now, I mean, the idea that uh, fields, in, uh, you know, overlap. So if you want to work in the health sector, you have to have a doctor. So you need to maybe train the doctor to be, you know, on some basic data uh, skills and vice versa. We don't have to go to the most, you know, highest educated, but even in the, low, you know, less, uh, less skill requirements, how can we get skills to work closely together and to cross skill to be able to have new entrepreneurial initiatives? The, 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 I think the challenge is how can we use novel technology, novel data collection methodologies for sure. And if the data exists, then you layer the data in different areas to be able to have conclusions that feed policies. So to do that, you need to have, uh, you know, proper algorithms and proper technologies to develop the new technologies. So that could be on new data or on existing data and maybe compare the new data with the existing data because typically statistical data will be collected top down and what we find is grounds up and you need to sort of, uh, you know, compare them. But really the areas are health and education for sure and, and new entrepreneurial initiatives. Because as I said, in Egypt and I suspect in other parts of the world, there is really a realization that health has not taken enough attention. And, uh, you know, people uh, are concerned more about, even when we think of, you know, lives and the economy, and the economy cannot function without people, and if people are sick, the economy will die, you know? As we've so, seen. <laughs> exactly. So it is health and education, for sure. This I would say. Of course, there are other issues that do not belittle other issues related to the environment and, you know, uh, other areas of, of research. But I would say the most pressing today, if I were today to press a button and have, you know, success, inclusion results, I would go for this. And women, of course, cut across the gender components, crucial. If you talk about health and, and education, yeah. that's for sure the inclusion of women, that goes without saying. Okay. And so, and you referred like a lot about uh, data in your answer and also like uh, in your talk. And so, but with there is an issue with, bad data like quality data and just sometimes just to be able to access that data and one of the questions in the chat is also like what about the the trust that you can put like in that data like can you 
are you worried about the maybe data tampering or that you know because also at some point you mentioned some corporation having like a full monopole of, of the data set are you like uh worried about maybe yeah, data tampering with someone changing the data to influence um uh, uh, policy or like result of agor algorithm uh. absolutely yeah i mean this is valid and my I, 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 my answer to that would be two, two things. Data tampering, again, will be uh, undertaken by people. And uh, let's remember that this whole uh, ecosystem is, reflects what is happening on the ground. So if there are biases on the ground, if there, are, if there is ill will, you know, if there is uh, the need to manipulate or misuse the data, which is and the algorithm for sure, and we all know examples of uh, you know, facial recognition and others, this is a threat that will always hold, and it is not only unique to uh, Egypt, it's global. So I would uh, look at lessons learned in dealing with this issue. Uh, for sure, the leg legislative uh, you know, environment would be very important, and to put checks and balances on that sort of thing. Always a threat in our part of the world is, is larger in view of our weaker institutional structure and our legislative environment, you know, stands to be... Uh, sense you know further improvements so this is would be always a challenge for sure and i would just resort to learning from other experiences and see how this has been tackled okay and so and you were mentioning like you know like uh, the position of uh, egypt and like vis-a-vis -vis the the other uh, countries uh, of uh, mena and one of the questions is like um so someone is asking are you in a position to compare uh, egypt's AI uh, policies related to like other uh, middle uh, income countries, uh, whether uh, in the uh, Arab or non-Arab uh, region. Uh, so, so the question is to how does it compare with others? Yeah. See, we don't have the full text of the AI policy and for uh, the AI strategy for Egypt, but. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have enough information to, to answer the question, but the one thing I will say is that what we did as researchers when we were working on this uh, project, we worked actually with the Internet, Master Internet of Egypt, and I should acknowledge their collaboration on this. What we did is we did a review of other strategies in trying to understand, it, and I remember Canada was amongst them, in trying to understand what other countries did and what would be uh, the most uh, sort of priority for Egypt. And this was done last year. And basically, I, I, what I remember, what I found closest to the reality, and in my opinion, what is closest to the priorities for Egypt would be India. India is a very clear cut, you know, objective is development. It is a real uh, application of the concept of AI for development. But I, um, I'm not sure I have enough information to undertake that comparison until the, the strategy is already out. So, um, yeah, that's as much as I can tell. Yeah. And are like the other countries in MENA also uh, having those kind of initiatives? Or is maybe like Egypt leading, you know, like on the uh, AI I conversation? I think if I'm not, I stand to be corrected. I think it's Tunisia is the one that has an AI strategy. Okay. Uh, I believe Tunisia is the one. I can double check for you. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, the, the other countries, uh, the Emirates, I always forget. I always think of middle income Arab countries. Oh, I would say by far the, the Gulf countries are leading. So the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, Bahrain, you know, uh, mm -hmm. even I'm not sure if Kuwait has, but definitely the United Arab Emirates is by far uh, quite advanced in that. They have a, a state minister for AI very early on and uh, is very well spoken, very well, uh, you know, they have a very clear plan. And that's why it usually ends up uh, ad attracting um, the brains from uh, countries like Egypt and the others. So, um, yeah. Mm. And uh, okay, I'm looking. Uh, yeah, and maybe also one of the the reason why the 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 countries of the Gulf or like uh, I've worked on this is uh, because the richer so there might be less connectivity uh, issues that you highlighted okay. is a big uh, point with Egypt. And so one of the question is uh, actually so. Uh, that you mentioned equal inequality from the lens of the lack of uh, internet accessibility uh, connectivity among uh, segments of the the population mm -hmm. and if i remember like they're not like 
small segment of the population. It's like yeah. uh, quite um, a big portion. And so policy-wise, uh, should policymakers consider workable solutions to facilitate access to AI uh, technology uh, without necessarily like dependent on you no know, access to internet, mm -hmm. uh, like either like strategy uh, about uh, about this, uh, or maybe to have like a mix of technologies, paper and AI, etc. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's. Uh, we all know the in the case of in in Africa where we have a mobile phone uh, penetration has is a, you know has expanded tremendously. E Egypt included. And uh, the, the use of the, the mobile phone penetration in Egypt is more than 100%. So everybody practically has a phone, not necessarily a smartphone, but a phone. So I totally agree. I think this is a great point is that we don't have to go for the highest end technologies. We can think of suitable, appropriate technologies that are suitable for the uh, for the people. I know that, for example, there was an interesting um, article at some point when uh, education, when schools closed about uh, education via the radio. You know, simple, simple technologies, just radio or, you know, uh, I'm not sure if, if paper, but at least communication. I think you need to have communication if we're going to assume that people are going to work from their locations. So if the Internet is a challenge, then definitely simple applications, the mobile phone, the radio, even television. Everybody watches television. So um, certainly. And just going back on the, I checked, and uh, uh, the, the countries that have, uh, like the, what you have in the Arab world, the middle income countries, there's uh, Jordan, Morocco, and Tunisia, they have a data protection law. But I believe Tunisia is the one that uh, had an AI strategy recently, and then other than the rich Gulf countries, just to, and actually Saudi Arabia as well, included among the, the rich countries who are actually uh, advanced in using AI. Okay, great. Um, another question, and uh, going back to you know like uh, AI that could be uh, that could be amplifying inequalities, but that might also sometime like uh, be able to to solve or like maybe bridge the the gap. Uh, and so one of the person in the chat is asking like, to what extent do you think that AI will solve or like I would say could solve inequality and um, uh, because like algorithm can have their own uh, type of uh, bias that could have a negative impact uh, yes. on the problem. And I know that there has been some proposal and last fall you said that amazing uh, workshop uh, in Cairo, but like yes. the narratives about AI and also I remember one of the panelists in the uh, second day was proposing to maybe just create a fake set of data with like our ideal society and yeah. train the AI on that just utopia. And that yeah. might be the only option because we cannot have quality data and biased uh, data, etc. So maybe if you could comment yeah. on this. Well, uh, it's, it's uh, just, to the question, uh, I think the, the again, the idea, the technology itself is maybe necessary, but it's not sufficient and data as well. In fact, my interview today, I was interviewing one of the entrepreneurs and for a follow-up interview, and he told me, he said, you know, at the end of the day, I work in data, and data is dumb. So the, at the end of the day, data is dumb. And, and I really like that quote because, uh, in my, I mean, it is data and AI and all of this may be necessary, but it's not sufficient because if you do not uh, have the rest of the, you know, contributing factors to achieve your objective, you, you can't really, it's not a magic wand. This is, there is always the, the threat of uh, technological determinism. You know, once we have the technology, everything will be okay. So to answer the question, the question is very valid. The, the technology will be used to mitigate inequality if and only if it is consciously bearing in mind proper, you know, um, the data that is as much as possible, uh, unbiased as much as possible, right? That is not also historic, that maybe you start from scratch because if you use historic data, historic will have its own biases. So perhaps you start and, and you know, look very carefully into what you have. And also uh, if you use it for, um, to actually include the marginalized. So if you use it for, and, and among the marginalized now, sadly it may end up, the youth may end up becoming marginalized because we have a high percentage of youth unemployment. And with what's happening, there are no jobs, and with the economy, what's happening after COVID-19. So how can we have actually inclusive policies for those, for the unemployed, for women, for uh, people living in informal uh, communities? If we are able to do that, then we are actually using the technology to mitigate 
inequality. Simple applications do, that can actually incorporate people, where people can enter uh, their data, where people can learn, you know, for education, where women can start businesses or have simple uh, entrepreneurial, small entrepreneurial initiatives. So in all of this, and just by speaking, it takes, you know, uh, not a village, but it takes a multidisciplinary group to achieve this. It cannot be done by technologists alone. That's why the graduate student, you know, whoever, um, uh, whatever field he or she might be in, I invite him or her to, in, you know, to to invite uh, uh, to invite other partners from other fields, or even at least supervisors from other fields, so that the work is taken in one direction and is multifaceted, just like reality is multidisciplinary. The real world is multidisciplinary. We cannot work in silos and solve a problem in detachment from reality. So, by the same token, the technology cannot be detached from what is happening around us in order to achieve inclusion and the exercise of a utopia would be ideal i wonder now with covid 19 you know how far is the utopia <laughs> yeah yeah our utopia right now is just to to maybe be back at before yeah. uh but you yeah, know i think the point you just made about like research and kind of research uh is super important i fully agree with you and actually we had like two or three uh people like in the chat asking about you know research agenda a way to do research on those kind of questions and yeah i agree with you we need to bring like everybody together and yes. and to have also conversation like between the the north and the south and like and yeah. in between the straw and, and go ahead no, no, no go, go ahead no i was just going to say if you want like specific research question i would say how can what are the specific blind spots in data just like you know what are the blind spots where are the gaps who is not visible? Who is invisible? You know, who is uh, uh, sort of swimming in a blur of data where their voice is not heard? Uh, who is uh, uh, completely outside the radar of statistics? This is, you know, the data. What is data looking at and what is it not looking at? And then you look at the algorithm. Who's making the algorithm? What's go mapping? What's happening? We're already working on this mapping exercise. What's happening in the region? What are the initiatives? And talk to people in the field. And Again, with an eye on development objectives, development priorities, health, education, for sure, inclusion of women and the marginalized, these, I would say, are on top of the research topics to be explored. Yeah, no, and like all over the world, not just in Absolutely. Egypt, I would say, Absolutely. all over the world, uh, we need this. So another um, question we had in the, the chat, so someone is commenting, so... So it's fully like um, agreeing with what you said about data and AI and fully appreciated your talk, but was referring, you know, to the current political uh, context and like the economical state in Egypt and the rest of uh, MENA with, so as you said, like lack of evidence-based policy making, a scarcity or lack of quality of data and just um, a political context that could akin to dictatorship, according to uh, that commentator. Uh, so do not pursue like pro programmatic or evidence-based policy, uh, but proceed like in a manner constrained by the priority of like preserving, you know, like the current uh, order, preserving power. And we could say so of so many countries uh, in the world currently, including in North America. Uh, are those, uh, or do you see these uh, challenges around data being addressed without maybe uh, tackling some fundamental uh, issues or like a need of changes uh, within society? Um, I think a big question to answer. <laughs> Well, I mean, there is, you, you mentioned the utopia earlier. So there is a utopia where, you know, you have an integrated set of uh, liberties, you know, civil liberties and uh, economic liberties. And, and part of that is freedom of information and social liberties and, you know, uh, privacy respected and people not asked about their gender and not asked about the religion and, not, you know, all of this. This is a utopia ideal world. And of course, if you have that, this would be perfect, and this would be the ideal scenario for uh, for operating. The reality is different, and um, what we have to do is we have to manage with what we have. And uh, the one thing that we cannot uh, dispute is the need for development. I mean, no one will, uh, you know, question 
the, there is a need for better health, even though health data will be taken as, you know, for national security and there's a, you know, protection of health data. But I'm hoping, I am hoping that sadly this crisis will bring a change of thinking, especially in issues related to development, health and education. Uh, so, uh, again, it's not ideal, of course, and we are functioning in, uh, in environments that are, you know, sometimes... Uh, can constrain our work, but at least it, as long as we are working in areas that have to do with development priorities, I think we are able to function without, uh, you know, without major restrictions, let's put it this way, you know. So I hope that answers the question. No, I think, <laughs> I think it does, like, it's just like, yeah. yeah, we need to negotiate within the exactly. different context, but also like to acknowledge those differences of context between like other countries uh yeah so uh was no, you wanted to say something no i was just going to say also those tensions can come not just from politically but also uh, they can be economic tensions i'll give you an anecdote uh, a few years back uh, we worked as a team again with the civil society and academics on open source software research and through advocacy at the time the government was convinced to, uh, that we write a strategy for open source. And I was asked uh, to, to, at the center to write the strategy, to draft the strategy based on the work that we collectively did with the civil society. And this was a clear, um, this was a very good exercise for me. I learned a lot why, because in the morning I was part of the ministerial committee. I would go to the ministry, sit and discuss how far we are able to raise the bar. And clearly, if you're talking about companies that rely on open source, the large proprietary companies, the one, you talk about market concentration, they are the ones who are very skeptical and, and trying to lower the bar of how far we can go. Then I finish that meeting and I go and meet my colleagues from the civil society and they are, you know, they are also trying to raise the bar naturally of how far we can encourage open source, uh, you know. So it was a big challenge, you know, sort of navigating these two and, uh, you know, groups. And in the end, we succeeded to find what was called the coexisting paragraph, which meant which showed how open source, which made the large companies happy that, you know, that they can coexist. So everybody was happy in the end. It was not ideal, it was not perfect, but it was a start. You could open the door and then push your way through again. So that sort of thing, one has to be practical given the circumstances, because otherwise you cannot really progress. So we learn to navigate those, you know, situations and find a niche and open and, you know, find a crack, if you will, and push forward our uh, paradigm to for inclusion. No, no, and uh, as you say, I think it's like our job, you know, as as researchers, because like all over the place, we're like in position more or less of like privilege compared to uh, many uh, uh, segments of uh, population which are like underrepresented and we often yeah. have like access to policy makers or like people in power. And I think it's our job to basically be that pipeline Yes. to like you know open the door and like help people and like bridge the id and help like uh yeah. to amplify some voices were like not heard uh either within our countries or like globally and like with, with that series this is what i've been trying to do to invite like some colleagues from like all over the, the world yeah. of like alternative vision and to say that yeah it's not just uh in Canada in north america and we can learn from the past experiences and like what worked, what didn't work from like across uh, the globe. Uh, yes. So yeah, so I'm, I'm again, I was delighted to to welcome you uh, today. We like, it's uh, 1 p.m. Uh, our time. So I think like maybe 7 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> in Cairo. Yeah. Uh, so we're like, uh, we're coming to, to an end um, to, to, that, uh, to that talk, but so, Thank you again so much uh, for joining us today and for like sharing uh, your findings uh, with you. And I, uh, I look forward to continue uh, that conversation virtually or not, because maybe yeah. when we will be able to meet again <laughs> in person. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so thank you again, uh, Nagla, Professor Risk, and uh, see you soon. And thank, thank you, you again for everybody uh, who uh, joined us today for that uh, great talk. Thank you, Florian. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.